So, <coughs> I guess today we'll be talking about code structure and how to analyze it and how to visualize it and how to understand it better and take a few examples from design patterns to analyze. So, uh, first, the uh, most important disclaimer when I get the next button working. Okay, uh, th this thing. Um, everything sucks, your job is to know what sucks less. Um, I start this with this uh, statement very often because there's always trade-offs that you must make and you need to be aware of what trade-offs are you are making. So, even when you start to analyze something, you're trading your own time against like a better, for a better code structure, hopefully. So, there's like, everything you do has some trade-off. And, uh, and yeah, often you hear the, like the good parts, but not necessarily the bad parts about things. So, usually when you learn about the bad parts, you figure out how it's something is useful and how how you can use it effectively. Anyways, uh, we'll start with a uh, few term, you know, a little terminology about code artifacts. What I mean by them, uh, basically, anything that you might write in a code or like is a result of programming. I consider an artifact of like because I need a like general term for something that like uh, that uh, represents everything that we do. Um, it will become clearer later why it's needed. But when I say code artifact, I mean any of these. This means like actual servers, processes, containers, folders, files, like classes rows, predicates, relations, whatever. Um, you don't know how to know everything here, but it's just like, uh, if you know some of them, then it's already great. Uh, if you know all of them, then it's even better. But it doesn't change too much about the topic today. <coughs> Does that make sense? No confused faces yet. Great. Um, next uh, is um, we need to understand that like when we're analyzing and designing something we need to be aware of like what we are trying to achieve for example are we trying to make it as performant as possible are we trying to make it as convenient to use as possible or are we like trying to make super secure stuff for like do we want somebody to extend it later? Or and uh, based on how you prioritize these different things, you will get, get the different result in your code as well. Um, for example, high performance code often ends up being more complex than the alternative, like more readable version. So. Um, you don't have to remember all of these, but you need to understand that there are a bunch of properties that we might want. There are things that we care less about and understanding the context where you are writing it uh, can give different results. Um, and in, in a single project, you might have different parts that require different uh, properties as well. For example, the game engine itself is like performance critical user code maybe that gets executed once per minute doesn't matter that much so it's maybe better if it's readable than really performant yeah so uh, if you if you do the sort of thing that is sometimes recommended that you first uh, write it to be super readable and don't worry about performance and then uh, start, you know, uh, when you test it, you identify performance bottlenecks, and then you start making uh, 
like rewriting it to be more performant. And what is your opinion? Is it uh, is it a waste of time to make it readable in the first place? Should I? Like it, it depends. Okay. Uh, usually, the readability gives also the uh, like understanding of the problem. When you start programming, you usually or often don't know what you're solving and how you're going to solve it. So keeping it as long as readable as long as possible definitely helps with that. Mm -hmm. Which means that later on you can make much better decisions when making it performant. However, like if you know that okay, I'm I will hit these performance problem problems anyway, so I can solve them immediately. There is a that when something like this uh, programming is the art of telling another person what you want the computer to do. Mm -hmm. So it's by that yeah. definition, yeah, we to read it. Yes, yes, yeah, sure. Usually, performance issues doesn't arrive immediately, they arrive. We come in later stages when you don't predict how often this code is uh, used in. Uh, in your project, uh, and uh, when you, you see that performance, then you try to. to no, uh, you can actually, you can do a lot of back of the envelope calculations. Like I know that though this pointer takes this much amount of memory, and when I uh, use a linked list instead of this uh, vector array, I will drop my memory usage from eight gigabytes to two gigabytes, for example. I can do this back of the envelope calculations to see that, oh yeah, this design doesn't work anyway, so I might not bother even with it. Um, so, yeah, um, kind of figuring out what properties you want and kind of is like a different topic completely. Um, kind of, you just need to understand that, yeah, there are a bunch of things you could do. So, sorry for derailing yeah. the conversation. No, it's fine. Uh, the, it's kind of uh, intended that way that you ask and interrupt. It's uh, better that way. Um, so, and yeah, of course, this is in the whole list. Like, yeah. And of course, we just don't have like the properties that we want. It's also like how we model the problem itself. Like how we think about the problem and how we break it apart and how we make analyze it. So there are a bunch of ways to like do that as well. Uh, I'm not going to explain those. Uh, just know that there are like, this isn't the full list. The full list is like 30 or 40 things um, or more. Um, this is excluding the special purpose ones like that you invent on the spot. But, um, uh, if you're like interested more, maybe you, from game programming perspective, you probably want to look up data-oriented programming, <coughs> um, which deals more with performance and uh, like how to, yeah, make fast things um, or things that have lots of things. Um. <coughs> Anyways. Does any everybody know what a paradigm means? Like, yeah, this is the mental model or like how you think about something. This is like necessarily how you write it, but more about just yeah understanding like uh, how you break things apart and uh, like whether you think of something as a class hierarchy or uh, a game object and components kind of thing. So. There are like different ways of thinking about these things. Anyways, we're not going to talk about this either. So um, we're going to talk about this. Um, these aren't my ideas. I'm just going to say these are Carlo Basia, and he has quite good, uh, like twenty blog posts about about these things and like the intricacies of this. I'm going to give the, trying to give it the intuitive understanding about the concepts and showing how you can use them. 
because uh, this uh, way of thinking has kind of um, helped me quite a lot in difficult problems and understanding not just how things uh, work right now, but how they will evolve and how they will like change over time. So, first thing. Um, kind of breaking this software apart is like uh, we don't want to like put everything in a single place because that's just un unmaintainable. So we want to like partition these different ideas about how we uh, like how we like execute the uh, program code and how we like how we store the data about this program and how like how they relate to each other and things. So this this is called the partitioning. So we kind of in essence we divide a program into different centers or like ideas that then uh, like store this information and are somehow related. Um, don't worry about what the markings mean, we'll get to that later. And of course, always when we like separate something, we create new artifacts. Uh, so we can break one artifact apart. For example, we take a class that has like eight methods. We break it apart. By necessity, we create two new we create one new class artifact and also because we need to use this now we need to use those both probably at the same places then we might create new variables as artifacts as well so always when we break something apart we usually create new artifacts um, at the same time this uh, partitioning or breaking things apart might like remove artifacts from um, other places and simplify in that sense. So there are a bunch of ways how we can like represent how things work and like the information what it works on. Like there are multiple levels, uh, like uh, layers and how they work. Uh, in for generality this covers all of them like you can represent uh, this hardware separation and function separation with these bubbles together so for example this might be a server and this might be i don't know some local variable um, i don't care about that um, these these uh, sketches are also like uh, more of free form and less specified does this part make sense? Um, before, uh, yes. Yes. It's a bit abstract in the sense. Give me an example of hardware separation. This is you have two servers in different locations in the world. Okay. You're so just, you're just naming it essentially. Yeah. So I'm kind of uh, instead of having one server, I'm st like ha dealing with multiple like uh, user authentication and uh, game logic uh, for I'll separate those two into hardware uh, different things um, uh, one is the authentication server the other is the game logic server and now by necessity I like introduce new artifacts between them which is network serialization and uh, like they need to call each other and when you're doing a request you need to kind of redirect this Client from one server to another and kind of do thing. And this is then one form of partitioning. Yeah, yeah. So you can kind of think of this as like you can like split up single executable into two or like multiple DLLs or create an interface yeah, and kind of like a bunch of ways you can split this information and uh, knowledge. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, anything else about this? No? Okay. So, now we can take, like, trying to figure out what is the, like, how these artifacts behave uh, when they are partitioned. Um, so, we kind of borrow ideas from physics and uh, say that yes every 
thing we every artifact has a mass which means that uh, so a longer function by necessity has a larger mass for example and then larger class has larger mass or and so on what this means is that it also behaves like a gravity thing, like thing that has gravity. Uh, this is kind of somewhat intuitive that when there's like when you have a bunch of things like that you call, you probably eventually need something else there as well. So this uh, single thing has has a large mass, often like grabs other things near it and kind of uh, tries to like add more things into itself so over time you can think of this gravity like uh, artifact with gravity as large gravity as pulling more things to closer to its itself okay like it doesn't matter whether it's code or or like a method or class or object or uh, whatever yeah Makes sense. Yeah, you can say, uh, like in code, usually say path, uh, you control the class in the path. Uh. Yeah, that's one version of it, kind of. Um, it's not just like having a mass, it's just having a gravity as well, like pulling things towards itself. Um, yeah, we, we couple uh, so many things in some class. <coughs> yeah. Um, there's a kind of saying that when you have like 20 uh, function parameters, you probably missed one uh, as well. So, uh, so when we now think about like what is partitioning giving us is uh, we can by partitioning different things, we can like reduce the mass they have. Like when we don't uh, like hold everything in one place, then it doesn't pull probably as strong together. Um, so, but of course, this partitioning does have these different costs, like uh, whether in just understanding the problem or like making the or adding new artifacts. Um, so, okay. What do you mean with scaffolding and plumbing? Uh, this means that you need, for example, let's say I split in my server into three servers. Okay. Now I need to have also this plumbing to like connect them together. I need to have somebody to like s deploy the servers and like maintain them. And so this is the plumbing and scaffolding, like just holding things such that I can use them. Mm. Uh, there's like, yeah. <coughs> or yeah with databases it's just you need to worry about data migration and uh, just running it uh, getting it running on test systems and okay um, anything one one place uh, so you can you know, if you if you run uh, so you create some uh, some uh, data from slave mode then it's hard to get it soon back to consolidate as I this not much. Yeah. Um but yeah. So and of course there's the cost of well, just understanding things, more things means we need to understand more things, kind of, uh, kind of obvious, but it's also about like skills, like adding really difficult abstraction layers means that everybody now in your team must understand them as well. Uh, so when you introduce logical programming in your gaming stack, then may maybe one other person will understand it and then you're like so slowing your whole team down. Um, so there's like more costs and just like uh, 
in the artifact space, but in the in people as well. Um, so the problem with credit is that it's incremental um, and it tries to keep itself like it just doesn't like when something like gains mass it doesn't auto like by incremental changes usually doesn't break about part automatically uh, so you need to have some effort to break it apart so for example let's say you're kind of adding one method at a time to a class it's hard to notice that so you kind of it tends to accumulate there uh, which means that you need to be consciously always like trying to avoid this uh, gain of mass in a single class process or kind of uh, whichever artifact you're working with. Uh. Okay, otherwise this will happen uh, to your thing, it becomes a black hole that just sinks everything into it or people of mod. Uh, but, uh, will you uh, teach us how to solve this people of mass? It, uh, it how to, to break it apart um, but, uh, in small amounts that uh, sometimes it's the uh, most hard part how to break it apart uh, yeah. but, but you don't take so much uh, you don't, don't mm -hmm. break other things that, we fix this like this is like uh, I don't like this uh, this mm. window. I break this window apart. Uh, okay, this uh, this uh, same this wall is not great. Mm. Also, I break this down. Like, okay, if, if this this is actually mm. you break down the whole uh, whole building and then it's uh, you won't fix it. But uh, you always think that oh yeah, this it sucks also. But, uh, but yeah. uh, Meant to say, stop and no, I will only fix uh, this small thing. Um, it's about. You know, you know still know you, you write bad code, it's not perfect. Uh, it's also about like understanding where you gain most value. Um, like when you're doing just uh, like cleaning up code, that's, that doesn't mean that it add value, adds value to the project. It adds value to yourself and your team at development speed. If like there's a piece of code that nobody has touched for five years and it works fine, and it works fine, then you probably don't create new value by just cleaning it up. So it's fine that sometimes some code is bad. That's, this is inevitable in big projects. You have to like figure out where you want to like focus your efforts on like, where you can create most value to the um, to like your customers uh, of course when you are like touching some piece of code it's usually the uh, scouts rule that yeah I try to clean up around it a little bit because if you have some it has this accumulative effect of when you're touching one place like multiple times, then you, it eventually like gets better, which means that it will probably change in the future here as well multiple times. So you're kind of uh, helping those places that need help, not just arbitrary places. Okay. Anyways, so we of course need to like fight this uh, gravity uh, thing or the black hole. So what we can do is, uh, of course, we can like figure out the architecture how to uh, avoid it. We can try refactoring like incrementally, uh, like pulling different things apart. Um, or we can try to visualize things better so we can understand different things better or just have for example during code reviews have something in place to detect these uh, problems uh, to avoid this in incremental and accumulative uh, like mass 
uh, growth, so you can just uh, detect it earlier. Uh, or use better languages, technology tools, uh, those help with uh, uh, it as well. Um. Okay? But since um, Now we have this mass idea. We can kind of think about like um, things that are like physically related. We have this uh, notion of inertia, like when something is moving and it has a large mass, then it's harder to like uh, divert it from its path. So, kind of things that move try to keep moving, uh, and we need to apply some force to counteract. Uh, the question is like, uh, okay, when we say that this, uh, these artifacts are moving in our space and this, we have this mass, so what is the space that these artifacts are moving in? Like, because we are kind of, um, let's say I'm like trying to refactor this previous uh, image into this new thing, what am I changing? It's not just the, uh, yes, I'm changing the artifacts, but like, uh, what is the space that they, uh, they are in? So there's, uh, yeah, uh, Carlo Pesio suggested that this uh, is the decision space, like decisions that we made, and like when we in inevitably make wrong decisions so to correct it we need to like move things in this decision space to get new artifacts and new like properties from them um, there's also this uh, notion of um, inertia which means that the larger mass something is the harder it is to move it through this decision space because there's more uh, things attached to it um, and it contains more things as well. Which is another way of saying it's harder to partition it, so or refactor it, right? Yes. But not just partition. Like any modification will be more difficult. Even adding new things into it is more difficult if it has large mass. So this visualization is the how things, are, classes, or objects are related to each other. What the uses for what uh, for how they co coupled or. or I'll, I'll cut to that. Uh, uh, you just need to know that these are just uh, artifacts, some sort of. They could be service methods. I don't know objects, bits on a RAM, whatever you want, or just uh, ideas or whatever and they are somehow connected. Um, <coughs> um, so, as we learn like new things about the system, we eventually need to like move those things. So having the things that have low mass means that we can much easily change this direction. Um, and, uh, or move them in this decision space. <coughs> so we can now think of architecture as trying to create the structure for these artifacts. Um, in a sense, uh, architecture is designing these gravity centers that try to keep this uh, these masses under control and like uh, changing as as necessary. Um, so a well-designed uh, architecture means that you don't get this accumulative effect of this uh, mass, um, or at least it will avoid it to some degree. However, like uh, wrong architecture will do the reverse and like speed up the process uh, of that. Uh. 
and there. Make sense? I know I'm talking really abstractly. If you want concrete examples, ask. Um, so are you promoting dieting? What? Are you promoting dieting to lose weight? No, I'm promoting healthy eating. No, I'm talking about in terms of keeping small mass and all that. Um, yeah, that's healthy eating. Yeah. Like, a diet thing is a kind of the refactoring, or when things have gotten worse. Like, um, <coughs> but there's, of course, there must be something counteracting uh, this gravity. Otherwise, everything would fall into itself. Um, so there must be some force that acts against gravity. One of those forces is multiplicity, which means that when you have uh, multiple similar or multiple things, for example, in a table, let's say you have a let's say you have a database with uh, authors and like books and uh, stuff. So by representing this um, multiplicity explicitly in the book, in a single table, let's say, you have this book name, author, like author name, author, I don't know, address in a single table. Like this is uh, the multiplicity, for example, a book might have multiple, um, multiple authors, so you add new columns to that table which means that kind of it becomes harder and harder to do that. So this multiplicity of these authors prevents this gravity from extending. So it kind of, when you're trying to like increase the multiplicity, you have this friction when you're adding these things because it requires more code, more effort, uh, the more items you add. But by splitting those like into two tables, you lose this uh, friction which counteracts the gravity. Um, okay, I think I lost some people. No, I think <coughs> um, then I will do this. Normalization. Kind of. Uh, that's part of it. Um, so uh, let's say I have books table with fields like uh, book name, uh, an author name, then I have this author uh, address, whatever. Um, so when I try to add new authors, for example, let's say I have like um, multiple authors, and then I realize that oh yeah, some books have like three authors and oh yeah there's one that has 20 like oh this becomes really annoying and anyone who has read the uh, code uh, what was it uh, well the WTF of uh, coding uh, uh, code uh, examples then there are s such examples uh, like people doing this Yes, exactly that. So, so this multiplicity of this author, by necessity, this friction that it creates, it acts as a force against gravity, because it prevents us easily adding new things, which like makes it harder to add this mass to this thing. Okay. Okay. But, but I mean, if you right now this thing has like more mass. Yes. But it, every time I add a new thing, it becomes more difficult. So it starts to like counteract this gravity of like pull, pulling in similar things. Okay. It's a friction kind of thing. So oh. so you need to kind of. Oh, okay, so it has more mass, but it still. 
gravity from acting? Yeah, it, it kind of makes it more difficult to add more mass, okay. in a sense. Of course, uh, when you do this, uh, uh, like book author, book ID, author ID, and like do this. Then you can, kind of, of course, avoid this friction, which means that it, this completely, like, reverses this mass situation and by partitioning. Yeah. Okay. Now, does it make sense? Okay. Um, of course, um, I'm not covering all the forces that um, the, the physics of software talks about, but the most important thing is uh, like understanding that the, the, the artifacts in like design time when you're like writing the code, the forces acting there aren't necessarily the same as when I run the code. For example, the property of performance is all about runtime. Whereas the mass or the gravity ideas are all about designing and like the artifact uh, level. So these are like different things and we can kind of analyze them differently um, or try to understand them and kind of try to move different things from one place to another. But uh, we'll get to that later. But it's important to understand that, yeah, when I'm talking about forces, it uh, like they usually are belong to one of them. Uh, some of them, I I'm not sure. I cannot remember whether some uh, forces were about both or properties. I mean. Um, okay. Now we come to the diagram. What it means. So, uh, as I said, the nodes are about artifacts, like things that we want to analyze in our code structures. Which means that it might represent a server or a class or a method or. I don't know, a comment somewhere. Um, and we can have here two types of uh, relations uh, in this diagram. One is attractive force, uh, things that are like pulled together for some reason. Uh, let's say one object calls another, so this is like attractive um, in a sense. And then there are rejection uh, relationships when like it pushes two things apart or like uh, something is uh, like uh, forcefully acting against this uh, pulling things together. So, um. Can you give an example of this pulling apart? Yes. <laughs> um, so here we have uh, conflicting uh, forces. And so these uh, like these three are pulling together. For a, we have this class one, class two that are have similar behavior or like common behavior. However, they are implemented differently. So this. Uh, Commonality in behavior like tries to pull them together because they are trying to resolve this or like to minimize this mass and because they are common in behavior they kind of tend to like change they tend to change together and um, and yeah evolve in similar ways then we have this counteracting force which is this different conventions which means that because they are implemented differently, 
like have different method names, different number of parameters, this pu pushes them apart, kind of. So we have two conflicting forces. One is trying to pull them apart, and the other is like pushing them together. Um, so this is um, effectively two forces are fighting against each other here, which means that we probably can improve this situation. So first of one of those, oh, okay. Um, but okay, before we get to that, we can like do an interlude for design patterns. So uh, design patterns. Uh, so uh, people kind of often kind of tend to think about them as like uh, best practices. They are really not best practices. Um, they are kind of uh, common practice. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are good or bad. Um, but it's uh, even more accurate to describe them as uh, practice that kind of tries to replace one set of forces with some other set of forces that maybe help you in a given situation. Um, but as said previously, like partitioning things at uh, new artifacts which can make things more complicated. Um, but they are good things to study in this uh, when trying to understand how this artifact space works and how things forces of like uh, problematic forces can be resolved. Usually, there are like hundred ways of to solve one problem. So, design pattern books usually give only one. So. Uh, be aware of that. Uh. <coughs> okay, back to this thing. Um, so the question is, what happens when we try to refactor it? Um, we there's a conflict of forces, and we try to resolve it. One is to let's say we introduce. A common base class, um, which means that this uh, refactoring, like this uh, hexagon, will counteract this uh, uh, force that uh, pushes them apart, but instead now becomes much simpler because they all have this base class that they can derive from. So we have like solved this force, right? Okay. And these examples are more about like learning to like, read the diagrams and understand them um, rather than uh, game games. Uh, so what if we have this uh, uh, for some reason we cannot remove this uh, different conventions uh, from our like visualization or our uh, artifact space? In that case, we can introduce this uh, design pattern called adapter, which uh, hides this uh, or removes this uh, counteracting force from the different conventions and kind of smooths it out so it doesn't push apart as strongly as before. Okay? No? <coughs> In a sense, it uh, somewhat mitigates this uh, problem of uh, classes pushing apart, and we can use a single uniform access elsewhere. So we have, uh, in one sense, we have minimized the mass because we don't have to have special cases for these different classes, class 1 and class 2. Okay. Mm. I think uh, this will start to make more sense when you go to more game-related things. Uh, so this is about like trying to like 
understand the artifact space and predict what's going to happen. So, um, we'll start with a simple thing called observer. So, we had this, uh, uh, let's say this is the, our game code, which does updating of uh, different entities in our game. Ignore the syntax, I just made it uh, enough similar to JavaScript so everybody can understand. Uh, so, what could we do here to resolve this? Uh, we have this update function that tries to pull in these, uh, acts as a, like attractive force for all of these different implementations. So, what could we do here? to counteract this uh, force. Ideas? So the question is, what do we need to do in the artifact space to make this happen, to contract this force? Perhaps uh, all of the objects should have their own uh, update function. Good. We, so, we so or, or move, uh, in a move. sense, what we need to do... Yeah. yeah. So, in a sense, what we want to do is like add something here. Wait, I thought I could draw with this. Oh well, no. Um, uh, old transti paint. So, in a sense, what we need to do is first introduce some something that acts as a force field against like pulling things together, which is like creating this thing that is our common thing. So the, this update thing would need to know only about this artifact here. Okay? In, in this case, you said that we need to make sure that every one of those have an update function which usually means that we create this artifact of inter... this is an interface, for example. Um, yeah, or abstract class. Or abstract class. Or it could be, I don't know, a function or a trait or whatever. Like there were a bunch of artifacts that I could... that I can use. I can... and I can even use some, like, generated code to do that for me create this uh, force field that prevents from uh, like this update function to from pulling these uh, together so in a sense what we do is we create this interface new artifact that pushes like these apart and then this update function can like pull uh, with this which means that the, the mass of this update function decreases, okay? Because it doesn't have that many connections and it's shorter. This uh, has some depends on how we push it. Uh, because we need to know what, uh, what order it push uh, make this up to get up to the first one. Yes. So, as, uh, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of uh, downsides from this partitioning. Like, like debugging is also more difficult when things are partitioned and kind of... So, yes, this partitioning adds complexity or kind of makes some uh, properties worse. Because you have to be 
before you can, they can uh, control the update flow more easily, but now you control it by push, pushing and, uh, and uh, maybe you want. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so in that case you might add uh, something into here, for example you add the uh, class method order that defines in which order they should be updated or something. So, so you kind of, you need this something often like to augment this interface, not just like, just this. Um, to make it work uh, for your set of properties. Of course, like adding this sorting and ordering means it now might become slower or might be more difficult to understand as well. Um, of course, uh, design patterns do have like standard ways of implementing them, like for JavaScript, one of those is like this way. I don't care about the standard ways of implementing this. I, I'm more interested in this idea how we break this artifact space and how we create these forces. We can substitute this, for example, here we used an uh, abstract base class. Um, we might use an interface or trait, or in this case, we might use a function uh, as the something that acts, or function, how to say, uh, function declaration, or, yeah, not declaration, function type declaration, uh, like how the, what the function parameters are as this, uh, so this circle represents a function instead. And this is the commonality between them. Okay. So this observer, what it does, it creates uh, something to hold these different uh, implementation and the way to add them there, remove them, and call them somehow. Okay. Um <coughs> so this can be implicit or explicit in your design. For example, this is unity uh, methods like update, late update uh, on trigger. This is essentially this observer thing because there's somewhere that they are all game objects are or mono behaviors are registered to, and then the, uh, the engine will call them in sequence and like notify them of something happening or some collision happening or triggering. So, okay. So. This is the same idea of uh, like breaking this apart, except that the uh, engine scale. The difference is we have much more, the interface that we create between them is much larger. Uh, questions? Nope. Really? Okay. If you say so. <coughs> mm. The next thing we can take a look at is this uh, hierarchy of things uh, or class hierarchies. Um, in complicated games you end up with this, this kind of hierarchy like, uh, uh, like I don't know, this we have this movable thing and vehicle and uh, car and car is a vehicle so uh, let's say I don't know I want to implement uh, Starcraft uh, base uh, the uh, what was it called uh, the humans at the base that could 
lift up and fly somewhere else. So where would you put the, put this thing here? Like it's not vehicle, it's kind of rigid, it's kind of vehicle. So you're kind of thinking like, uh, yeah, where should I put this thing? So what we have here is that we have this hierarchy of uh, things, like let's say this is the entity movable and this is rigid. So we have this some set of common properties that we want to include in our thing, uh, this uh, command base or whatever we call this. Uh, um, so this will start to pull these two leaves together, like uh, as an attractive force. Because this hierarchy implicitly means that uh, these things are tied together, they also pull things together. So it kind of acts as a, like a zipper, like trying to like uh, pull common behavior upwards. Uh, because now we need this some of this rigid behavior and movable behavior together, um, or this vehicle and rigid behavior together. So these two, like some of these things, kind of move upwards. So this base class starts to accumulate things because there are many things connected to it, right? So this is the mass thing that because there are many things connected here, they start to pull together. Okay. The question is, what, when, what can we do about it? Yeah, uh, so, yes, that is one solution. Um, uh, I should have avoided the spoilers. <laughs> um, but yeah, by splitting this hierarchy apart and kind of thinking about things composing of uh, behaviors, we also pull apart this zipper or like this uh, uh, thing of mass and we can, each system can then like pull these components independently together. So we don't have this, uh, this strong pull of them and uh, can they can independently evolve much easily. Of course, yeah. Can you make an like, example for it? You mean? Mm. I mean, it's somewhat confusing for me. Like, how, how do you split them apart? Um, You know, uh, okay, Unit has game objects yes. and it has components. So this this is splitting them apart. Oh. Instead of like uh, deriving something from the base class and like adding an audio listener to it and then inheriting from that and kind of so on. Instead you add a component to it. Okay. Of course, in the process of doing that, we need to have something that now manages these components in a single game object. And kind of, maybe the construction becomes more difficult of the game object. So for a simple game, this this approach might have lower mass for a complicated game. This probably has lower mass overall. Make sense? Then, uh, prototypes. Um, Here's another uh, situation. Um, as you noticed, we've kind of uh, represented with those circles and um, arrows and different things uh, along the way. 
and it's important. Like you can represent anything, and you can kind of draw your whatever problem you're trying to solve, draw it out, and kind of draw these lines between them, and see how it kind of makes sense. And yeah, this might have high mass and low mass, and kind of analyze it that way. So these are more of uh, like studies, to how to use it, or simple studies how to use it. So we have this um, inheritance problem again um, because of these uh, different implementation we have this uh, it starts to create a large pass in other classes because um, wait I didn't draw this uh, this part here uh, right um, so. Um, so let's say I have this inheritance here and now I want to use them in my code then I might like end up with these multiple connections as well um, so I might need to use this one but my code needs special behavior and kind of uh, like this inheritance starts to pull things uh, together and then kind of increase mass elsewhere uh, but uh, so here's an interesting like modification to this artifact space is by instead of using these inherited classes we replace them with uh, data or runtime objects what it means it, instead of uh, specifying like uh, this is the inherited class I will specify something about this uh, what what I want it to be like, uh, so I will push all my implementation details into a single class, like how the monster attacks and kind of how the health works. This reduces code mass because now I don't have these different implementations of class and like attacking and uh, defending or moving and. Uh, but it also gives nice properties that now I can store these properties in text files or modify them at runtime. So when you think about uh, Unity, you have prefabs. So prefabs effectively are these prototypes you define them in the Unity editor and when you create them in your game they instantiate into runtime things so we have moved some of these artifacts into runtime and uh, some of these we have moved made uh, represented these artifacts differently than before, so to make it more configurable and uh, easily modifiable. Yeah. So, um, is it somewhere related to the um, Kind of. Yeah, uh, so scriptable object is one version of it. Uh, so we, uh, scriptable object is essentially a simplified component. Uh, but uh, properties, yeah, you can still define like prop properties on them or like values, for example, I don't know, this health on this component is like 50 and I don't know, strength is 80 and so on. Yeah. Okay, let's just say if we create a base class with all these three parameters, health, strength, and speed. Yeah. And then we uh, create uh, drive classes, like for example, human or or orc. Yeah. And uh, from those classes, we create an object and yeah. we save it as a uh, prefab. Yeah. Then that prefab is prototype of that. 
or yes, that is still a prototype. That is still a prototype. But you are saying that we are going to exclude those uh, base classes here, like the base class. Um, so in Unity, all of these are briefabs are essentially prototypes. However, we are class inheritance or thing works. Uh, the classical prototype pattern is about how to create this prefab-like thing, in a sense. So, in a, you could make implement this prefab in the same way that you say that yes, I have this instead of base class, I have a game object now, uh, and instead of these inherited classes, I have components that represent uh, these behaviors. So this becomes this prefab that you can copy and instantiate the trunk line or modify a trunk line. More questions? No? Okay. <coughs> Um, okay, let's take a look at a uh, different kind of force or problem <coughs> is uh, uh, fracturing um, and compressive force. Uh, so here I have uh, like different classes, I don't know, you could represent them as game objects or components in whatever language you want. Uh, I'm just using these for example. So not real code. Uh, but the problem is as following. We have these two ideas of entities and audio, like something that tracks where what the, what is in the game world and one is the audio system. So what you might do is like pass all of these uh, in constructors and kind of when you create them you pass them in to the constructor and instantiate them that way. Uh, what this does is here we have this update calling this uh, creation of the bullet which where update calls uh, another like this uh, explosion and the with the parameters of entities and audio and kind of all down the chain. So what you have is you have this um, chain of calls here and uh, since we need to pass all of this information through this, this chain here, it starts to pull these ideas together in a sense. So it starts to like split them it split them because uh, like this lowest thing tries to like access these things here so it acts like a compressive force that breaks these uh, into two and kind of adds noise in all down the chain right okay so what we can do here is to use a global variable hooray um, everybody loves those um, um, I'm ignoring the single instance part right now. Uh, I'll talk about that later. Um, what we have done now is we have added a lot of co convenience here. Um, we have substituted this compressive force uh, for something else. So we have kind of, uh, compared to the previous, this implementation of monster and bullet and explosion are much simpler or less noisy, let's say. Of course, while doing this, we have created things that start to have large mass. These global variables that are hard to move around and change. Uh, one, yeah. Uh, can you elaborate this term mass? Um, by mass, I mean uh, something having uh, either like large amount of uh, methods or callers or 
relations to other things. So in a sense, it's like like the more relations it has to other other things, the more mass it has, which means it's more difficult to move. Kind of. Yeah. Of course, we have now introduced another problem. Let's say I want to in my game I want to implement uh, a SOAP game where I uh, have this, I don't know, like I have a game console and I walk up to it and can play some Arcanoids uh, or something, Asteroids. Um, what we might do then is instead of uh, having like this strong uh, compressive force is to replace it with uh, a smaller force by combining these two systems together and passing them down like just one thing always so this is called uh, in some sense it's called service locator so we have um, partitioned or created a new thing that we can pass through the chain and avoid this large fracture between those Which means we can also, down at some point here, substitute the audio system for some reason when we might need it. It's a container, basically. Yeah, it's container for things that need to be passed down. Here we go. It's used um, a lot of frameworks, and not just game, other languages. Also. Yeah. So. So these things are, are about like, trading off different forces for some other forces and uh, for example this might be the most convenient to use uh, but it has like it can get messy to when you are using it. Uh, <coughs> Oh, uh, the singleton, there's also uh, the single instance part, which is uh, like protecting this global state so you don't accidentally like create multiple of those and like di uh, different systems cannot agree what is the, where is the world actually stored. Um, there are different solutions for this compressive problem. Uh, for, uh, like thread local storage and kind of like hiding it uh, in inside the programming language but uh, in essence they add some other problems again um, then we can take a look at the pattern called flyweight um, this is about runtime properties uh, in artifact space we have this nice definition of what the tree is um, but the problem with runtime is that yeah this might use a lot of memory let's say I have a million trees each tree is like I don't know one megabyte then I have a lot of megabytes um, <coughs> uh, what I could do is replace this runtime artifacts or runtime instances by like sharing this information that uh, is common to them. What we do is we create this new artifact, this model that each of these trees can now use and this reduces significantly the memory usage. So we have uh, made decisions in our artifact space because of properties in our runtime. Yeah. So they can affect each other. Uh, of course, now somebody needs to take care of freeing this, allocating this, holding onto this, uh, like loading this into the GPU and unloading it which makes 
are gold more difficult to handle. So we have traded, uh, we have gained performance and memory use uh, and uh, lost readability. And anyway. <coughs> okay. So this is the flyweight. We create something easy that or small that can be shared and passed around. Uh, so it doesn't weigh. Yeah. You want to task? Yeah, uh, I'm not just talking about Unity. Like uh, it's yeah, like Unity materials, material blocks. Uh, there's yeah, probably prefabs and that kind of bunch of things. That like use. Yeah, yeah, they use it. So there's usually only one instance of a material in Unity. So when you change this material you create a new instance. So this might, for example, let's say I have like 100 trees and I s in my update function I say material.color equals uh, something random, then I might get a huge performance drop because now I don't have just one material, I have like 1000 materials. So this means you need to do this, um, this parameters, uh, separate the parameters that you want to pass into the material and uh, you effectively you should use material box in Unity for that to I avoid these problems. Uh, sprites for example already have this built in, you can change the sprite color uh, independently from the material. So, uh, game loop. Um. <coughs> so, this is about uh, when people start learning how to write games, they, and with, a, with not like writing their own engine, they usually clump together all this input rendering and update logic. Uh, so what the game loop does to these different things is try to enforce a certain like structure and uh, break them apart uh, to make some things possible. Uh, because when you now want to run this update loop faster than you can render, then you cannot do it because the updating and rendering is tied together. Of course, with uh, UI frameworks, uh, this approach can make a lot of sense because um, you might gain performance or memory usage um, from that. Um, instead of like every single frame rendering it, so you only render when it, something changes in your system. Um, so you. Effectively, what you do is the game loop creates this. Uh, we create this game loop, which has uh, this by nature this architecture or the separation of this input, update, and render. Uh, also in Unity, you have uh, this update and fixed update. One is for physics, one is for general updates and rendering. By separating them means we can, for example, update m faster than we can render, or sometimes even vice versa, you can render faster than you can update um, by interpolating from one place to another. Uh, and it also means we can yeah, do some lag compensation or more easily add time dilation. Okay. And let's take a look at command pattern, which uh, the artifact space actually looks pretty similar to the uh, 
what was it the to the observer example. So what we would like to do is to have more control over these uh, move, hit, build things because they can start to build, pull in these different uh, like implementations of like things that the monster can do. Uh, let's say it's a hugely complex system where you have t hundreds of different <coughs> behaviors that the monster can have. Um, in that case, what you might do is you could introduce a new. Hello. Okay. Uh, we can create this new like force field uh, interface command that we can more easily detach from the monster and then uh, like pass around or create queues of the commands or attach different more information about this command to it. For example, you can implement undo or redo or something to change. Uh, so it gives, what it does, it creates this new artifact and by creating this new artifact means we ca have more flexibility in implementing these artifacts instead of just having them as methods. We can attach more more to them. Questions? No. Okay. So that was actually it. Um, I think this kind of covered how you can analyze difficult situations and predict how they evolve and how you can like represent and visualize them and then um, by understanding this like mass and inertia and uh, how they pull and push how to try to counteract these forces that you have in your like visualization and hence also make smarter decisions how to uh, design the system. Uh, it's a really useful tool for analyzing it and um, so yeah. Uh, questions or like some particular situ situation that you are now wondering about. Yeah, what what is the like force field or how how they interact in some places or uh, or something. <coughs> question is what properties do you want like uh, it might be might not be uh, so okay um, so to make it more something like this uh, this is the new audio system implementation whatever like and then you can publicly access this audio here okay. so this is like what you're talking about right uh, is, is, is it function? start uh, no, 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 this is say I want to uh, make common as 
like as a static instance, like as a single instance. So what I would do is public static common, and then instantiate common in the start of the uh, in the start of this class, like in the start. Of the this so this is public stack common. No, no. <laughs> Just make yeah, yeah. instead of common. It's uh, not common. It's not the audio system. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, that's fine. Oh, you mean you have um, okay. mm, class uh, audio system, and then you have this uh, public stack oh, okay. kick. Uh, oh, yes. Your system instance, yes. yeah, and then start to oh, wait. Oh, ah. oh, wait. well, yeah, it oh, doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, and then you create this. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, but essentially, you have to also make sure that the instance is that if, if the instance is null, then you're going to do that. Otherwise, you will still have multiple ones, except that they overwrite each other. There's the possibility of that. So uh, <coughs> this is terrible for coding. Mm. Okay. Um. <coughs> So when we try to effectively what it does, it creates this um, audio system thing, right? And it has uh, well, it has this instance inside of it. Uh, well, that probably doesn't matter that much. So you have multiple places that are using this audio system directly, right? Mm -hmm. Or instance. So what will start to happen is that once you're kind of adding more more things here, that this starts gaining mass. Which means because everybody is using it, it means it's more difficult to change it. It also means that it's uh, it might start <coughs> gathering different methods from all of these places that are using it. Right? So this is the uh, like prediction that we make because this is used everywhere. This means it has mass, which means it will start gaining more mass. Which means it has uh, larger inertia in the future. So the question e is, is this uh, fine for us. Let's say that, um, okay, I know I'm not going to do anything complicated with the audio system. I'm not going to implement some dynamic uh, audio system thing, whatever. Uh, it's probably fine because uh, even if it gains a little mass, I can deal with it in the future and probably the project won't survive long to like hit this threshold of becoming a problem. So I made a decision that, uh, okay, I'm fine with this gaining mass a little bit. And in return, I gained this simplicity of not having to kind of pass this all everywhere and handle that uh, thing there. So what, what our, now the question is like, not just like, okay, I made this decision. What are the other options how I could implement this? Uh, I guess uh, everybody before I um, start. I mean, I use the same so I Well, kind of figuring out how to design the systems is about figuring out different ways of implementing things. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing, but 
So, the, how will the artifact space now change when we do that? I don't think so. No, it has to change because we have changed the artifacts. Oh, Yeah, so we have this inheritance from like singleton. singleton, and yeah, the rest is probably similar. Yes. Yeah, but what what has happened by like adding this partition here? This means that now anybody using this code must also understand the templates and how they work. But we, mm, and in return, we have avoided three lines of code. <laughs> <laughs> I avoided it, we have replaced it with more lines. It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in essence, we have like slightly reduced code mass here. Uh, maybe we can do some. Uh, little bit more safer version of the singleton there. Um, the singleton probably doesn't change in the future because it's a really concrete idea and it probably won't gain mass unless we start to hit problem that, oh yeah, I have a singleton. But three, the three but why is bad? Uh, because uh, you can't use it in uh, three, three, the three value uh, trees. Uh, can uh, the process can uh, access maybe this uh, data from singleton or communicate with each other? Um, I'm not sure what do you mean. Or okay, I'm thinking <coughs> expressing this in that. But the I read that the singleton is uh, try to avoid it in some situation from from people or programmers hate the yeah. Uh, well, I'll get to that. Um, why? Kind of, this is the problem. Like, because there are many connections coming into it, it starts to gain mass, which means that like it's harder to move the singleton later. Which means it, for example, in testing, it's hard to like change this uh, under the hood while running the tests. You cannot run them in parallel that easily anymore, and kind of do all that all that kind of stuff. So it becomes harder to move it by being a singleton. Um, OK. And I hear, oh, this uh, base class thing. What other thing might happen is that instead of uh, things only going just singleton, maybe you also want to have an observer pattern uh, in your base, in your whatever audio system class. So you implement a new base class for observers. And so now you need to inherit from two things. Or, yeah, I don't know whether C Sharp let you do it. Mm -hmm. Probably not. So you en implement a singleton observer, and you implement a non-singleton observer. Uh, so kind of extracting this base class means that adding some certain artifacts between from this to here becomes more difficult. Mm -hmm. So you might want to consider like which I want which gives me more flexibility or clarity when I'm implementing it. Um, as for other other ways of implementing this um, I'm In Unity, I'm not sure whether there is a good way. Well, what you can do is, uh, let's say you have this uh, thing that starts everything up, one component. And when you create anything, you pass in this audio system, like, to all of them. And this results in this uh, fracturing and compression problem. Um, so we are kind of like picking whichever is seems nicer for us.
Oh, uh, also what we could do instead of having this, um, uh, well, we could do the service locator thing, which means that we have a single uh, systems or like where we have this audio instance and we make this system a singleton. So everything that needs this global audio system can use it from this system here and then uh, for those that need special handling you can pass in this implementation this way. So you are kind of choosing both uh, or you can use both. Of course this means that it's more complex because you now have two ways of doing the same thing. Uh, but you gain flexibility from it. And you could possibly go in further with inversion control from the uh from the start of now. This one this one or yeah, well uh as soon as the full uh depend dependency injection framework. Yeah. You could do okay, that's uh well it's not no need to go No it's uh, I think it's a good example. Uh, so, uh, so instead of uh, like uh, you have something else in your system and that wires up this audio system into here like this game object somehow magically um, which could mean that when you're let's say you're instantiating this object you could specify uh, oh yeah when you're great this let's replace this audio system with something else instead of using this global thing um, so what it does it does avoid this fracturing because we don't or like partially avoids this fracturing um, it avoids this in the constructor itself um, but it still creates this noise of having this uh, reference everywhere or everything that uses it. This also affects the runtime properties of having to use more memory of just storing this reference to this uh, audio system. Okay. Um, with dependency injection, there, was, there is also the human concern that uh, debugging this uh, automatic injection is more difficult and understanding it is also more difficult. Other ideas or questions? Yeah. yeah. Most of you have survived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you. I think uh, you should mention also that uh, if you want to read more about the same patterns, you would start with kind of four and the C. No. Uh, no, start with game programming patterns. Okay, That's yeah. a better book but than Mega 4. Yes, uh, uh. apply uh, in all, you can apply in everywhere. Yeah. Uh, in game, if you understand the, is the idea, concept. Of yeah, the, the, as I mentioned, you have always, when you're doing this partitioning, which most of the gang of but, um, gang of 4 things are, you're creating new artifacts which are yeah. causing some problems when you like don't have really the problem uh, that they solve. Um, that's why I'm recommending game programming patterns because they are more explicit about the exp examples and much clearer in that way. That's why I was interested to hear this uh, new way that masses and, uh, and gravity and uh, think about problems uh, this way. Yeah. When you are really close. Well, okay then.
Thank you.